at Fuge's Wild Woods. Hey, Dennis. Hey, Bob. How are you? What a great shop. Oh, I'm so excited to be here today. Okay, this is the upstairs of Dennis's studio. And of course, this is Dennis. And Dennis, what are you going to teach us today? Well, Bob, I thought we would teach the uh, audience how to make these little mice. They're non-cheese eating mice. And they have a little slot in the back where you can put the name of the cheese like Dodo, Stilton or Camembert. And when you put pressure down on the mouse, instead of touching the cheese, you push down on the mouse with the one hand and you cut the cheese with the other. And the second item I thought we would show today would be one of these jewelry trees. I've never met a, a lady who wears pierced earrings that doesn't love one of these jewelry trees. This is a one, two, three, four, five stage tree with a little uh, tray at the bottom and you can also put your rings on the top so it's ideal this is just a two-stage one for earrings and little rings and then the chains go in the bottom okay and here's a two-stage one okay. yeah this cool. one's a heart-shaped one okay terrific and then folks what I do is decorative platters as well we won't be doing those today but these are made out of eggshell and bits of metal and moons and pewter. So that's a series that I do quite often. I teach that at Aramont School of Art and I'll be teaching at the Campbell School of Art. And I have a whole series of jewelry here. This is one of my latest items where it's a little pewter bowl with a pewter rim and a pewter foot. And I think you may have seen me doing that on one of yeah. Bob's uh, yeah, previous we workshops. We do have a video on that specifically. And then here, is a, here are all the catalogues where I teach. I teach at the Aramont School of Art, teach at Peters Valley, teach at the Campbell School of uh, Art. So those are some of the places where I do my teaching. And then there's some jewelry busts and ladies hats that I'm also quite well known for. Wow. Yeah. Oh, it's got the little, it's got the uh, jewelry holder up there. Yeah and made many hats and around here there's some more platters i make these golden retriever platters and every golden retriever owner wants one of them it's got the little dog's footprints burnt in and the little golden retrievers running all over the platter. yeah these are spectacular really really nice and very popular what do you got here oh, what? these uh these little mice are made out of pots. pencil crowns which you then use uh, epoxy to glue it all together, two-part epoxy. Okay. <laughs> then here's one of my craziest pieces. It's called the Manhattan Mouse House. And I think it's got 37 different mice, all made out of different woods. African blackwood, redwood, oak. They've got a little swimming pool. They've got their little cabana where they can lie out under the sun. You uh, demonstrated and showed this at the AEW National yeah, in North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, spectacular. Some of the that I do. Got a little happy face on this platter. Yeah. Wow, nice piece of wood. Back through here, I have a whole lot of deep hollow vessels and urns and things that, uh, that people come and purchase. Yeah, tell us about your business a little. So Fugis Wildwoods, I do a lot of teaching uh, at the art schools and at home. So people will just contact me by email and say, can I have a lesson? And then we choose a suitable time and we do it. This is the series that I was teaching uh, on Zoom recently. It's deep hollow vessels from the bottom up. The candle in the wind, the pewter finial for the top, and the leather wrap with the malachite rings. So that's been quite a popular series that I've been teaching uh, up and down the East Coast mainly. Then those are different platters. This is a Norway spruce that was going to be the tree, the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, but the people wouldn't sell it. And then Superstorm Sandy came, came along and knocked it down. So they asked me to make some sentimental items for them. Various deep hollow vessels, bowls. How's the finish on this is what? 
these black ones. That's a liming wax over an Indian ink or a leather dye. Probably a, a, probably a leather dye to get the black and then a liming wax into the uh, cracks, into the, uh, okay. the grain. Wow, look at all this. No lack of creativity at Dennis's place. Mixture of wood and metal. Big hollow, I'm sorry, uh, natural edge bowls. Serious natural edge vase. Yeah, two color vessel. So folks, as you approach the lathe, the most important thing is your safety, right? You've got to get a decent helmet. This is one of these 3M Airstream helmets that blows HEPA filtered air down the, down the back of your head. You just stick a battery on and it blows fresh air down the front of your face so it protects your lungs and your face at the same time. And this one you can see is fairly banged up because it saved my face at least two or three times oh, from right. serious right. accidents. Yeah. So it's quite important to protect your yeah. lungs and your face. So even experienced turners can have an accident as demonstrated oh, yes. here. Dennis has been turning for how long? 50 years now. 50 years and a catch still happens or so a piece of wood disintegrates somehow and can uh, really smack you in the face well. So this is a, a very good piece of kit. It's not a absolutely necessary one. I also wear a glove. The AAW recommends not to wear a glove, but I have these fingerless gloves that I've been wearing for 50 years to protect the side of my hand. Yep. So a little bit about safety. I'm working with a one-way 2436 lathe. For my main lathe and then I have a small 1224 one way there. So I'm a, this is a one way shop that I'm working in. And then I, my only other piece of kit for wood turning is the Delta 14 inch bandsaw. And that's pretty much it. Everything you see me make, I make with those three tools. Obviously a grinder with a um, Vector grinding system. I fell in love with uh, Johannes Michelson's grinding system. So I have a vector grinding system that gives a fairly round profile to the front of your bowl gouges. And that's my kit. That's, okay. you know, the rest is working process, deep hollow vessels, all sorts of kit. All right. Lots of tools, obviously. Plenty of tools. A lot of them, a lot of homemade handles, they see. Yeah. Then I've got all the uh, kit here for Zoom demonstrations as well. My computer sits there. I've got my uh, monitor. So a lot of kit for Zoom teaching as well. Okay. And you've got an interesting dust collector system here that um, has a uh, adjustable arm up there. Yeah. So yeah. wherever the sand sawdust right is going to my lathe. Yeah. That helps to protect my lungs. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay. The project we're going to work on is uh, that jewelry tree and after you've cut a nice tenon on the one side of your wood you want to wedge it into your uh, headstock, into your chuck. I like to put a bit of pressure on the front as I'm clamping it down and then I bring my tailstock up to make sure it enters the little center that I had before. Once my tailstock is jammed up, I release my chuck again, I wind my tailstock up and I make sure that the piece of wood is really in tight. Now for the jewelry tree, I like to have about a two inch uh, at the bottom. I'll just get the ruler and show you. I'll just turn the lathe on real slow because I don't have a helmet on at this stage. But I like to have about a two inch bowl at the bottom, so you can see there's two. And then for each stage, about a three inch gap. Because I think the longest earring you can get is about a three inch. So this will be a one, two, three stage with a bowl at the bottom. The piece of wood you want to use needs to have about a four inch base at the bottom, so that it's a nice stable base for the jewelry holder. And we're going to trim it down to a Christmas tree size of about three inches at the top. So the first thing is to trim this down. So
so that you have about a three inch at the top and a four inch at the bottom. I will get my helmet on. Lane speed way up. Just raise my tool ever so slightly. So where I'm holding the tool, as I'm rubbing this bevel, you can see it's a fairly small bevel, it's about a quarter inch bevel, and I'm holding the bevel against the wood and then running it down. So it's a proper, I'm gliding the bevel down the wood in order to get the cut going. So let's have a look at that. Now I've marked my three inches on my tree again and the secret now is to do each stage at one at a time. So do the top stage, finish it to 600 grit, then do the next stage, finish it to 600 grit and slowly work your way down okay. so that you don't get any vibration in the wood as you're working. Let's talk about the wood quickly. This is ambrosia maple and you can see the ambrosia beetlers drilled a few little holes into the wood and that's what gets these beautiful spalted lines into the wood. The beetle creates a fungus as the, uh, in, into the hole the fungus will fall and the little babies as they come out of the hole they'll eat that fungus as their first food. So now we're going to switch to a quarter inch bowl gouge. It's my favorite go-to tool for doing these because this is really just a series of little bowls. So we'll create the top finger first. All I'm doing is a series of bevel rubbing cuts as I cut in and I give a little bit of pressure with my back finger so let's watch that cut carefully and then I'm going to creep up on that line. So I get my bevel lined up and I push with my back thumb so that my tool enters the wood nice and strongly. So then I creep up on that line and I give it one last push and there I'm on my line and the tool comes around always with the devil engaged now I'm going to create a little bowl at the back at the bottom with the devil engaged and then push Time lapse. So people always ask me how thin this must be. And I always say it's as thin as this chuck that I use. So this is the chuck that I'm going to use to when I return the piece. So as long as that finger fits on, you can see it's a little bit tight. So I just need to do one more little cut down there and this little donut mold will fit nicely. So folks, let's just give you a dimension on that. So that's about, at the top, it's about a three-eighths of an inch. And at the bottom, you're down to about four, five, six-eighths of an inch. And that should fit a normal ring finger, right? So that the rings can just stack up on there. Okay. Okay. So the plan is to do this one, two, three times. Okay. So once you've got the top set, you then need to move through all of your sanding grits. So 
So we're going to do the start of the next stage and then we'll fast forward uh, through the rest. So it's a, it's a lot of little bevel rubbing cuts going in and then from this side. A little bevel rubbing cuts all the way. So folks, what you want to do is to try and get this about an eighth of an inch thick so that when you drill through, the earring hangs nicely. Then you want to get a really nice sweep on this bottom. And you want to get the stem at the bottom to be about the same size as this finger at the top so that it looks aesthetically pleasing. So then folks, once you've finished your one, two, three stages, you've then got to finish the bowl at the bottom. And that can be a tricky, <coughs> a tricky bit because it's slightly deeper than these other fairly shallow bowls that hold the, um, the chains. But it's a classic um, bowl turning. It's the same thing. You get your bevel rubbing and then you've got to dive in. Time left. But when you cut this bottom, you need to just glide your bevel. It's really not a bevel rubbing cut, as Johannes Michelson would say. He says you've got to glide your bevel. And that prevents the grain tear out at the bottom. Because if you do get a lot of grain tear out, then you're going to spend about half an hour just sanding that area. So it's really just gliding your bevel rather than a bevel rub. Very, very gentle glide. And as you come up the stem again, your bevel is rubbing, gliding all the way up the stem. Okay. So then is just to hit everything with a nice 600 maybe even a thousand grit you can see this is a 600 grit with everything nicely with a 600 and i move up to a 1000 grit and you just do everything with a 1000 grit then once you've got your four stages all finished you want to put your donut chuck or your ring chuck as it's called in the chuck and then you want to feed your piece in and return your tailstock into that exact same little hole and just a gentle pressure on the front because you don't want to break this bowl here now we can finish off the bottom of the piece okay and bring my tail my tourist around now a series of little bevel rubbing cuts will just define the bottom A little bit of a bit of What you want to do is put your tool across the bottom and make sure that you have a nice concave surface so that the jewelry the tree can rest on this outer edge. And this side, if you want to make sure that the bowl is beautiful, you can switch to a sheer scraping cut. You get these beautiful little curly shavings. I call it Chalice Terron's little blonde hairs. But if you want to use Madeline Monroe, you can use Madeline Monroe too as your model. But the idea is to get these beautiful little curly shavings coming off your tool. We're using the bottom part of the tool, that long part of the flute and the top part of the tool.
tool is only about an eighth of an inch away from the wood and you get these beautiful little curly shavings. Once you've got your cut going, you're actually going to be looking at the horizon and not where you're cutting. You just get that beautiful shape of that boulder. And that's a lovely sexy shape that I have on that bowl. Okay. So at this stage when you've got your piece <coughs> jammed up against your ring chuck and you've still got a little piece of a nib at the bottom what you want to do is turn the lathe speed down and you want to draw with your pencil a, a ring about an eighth of an inch in there about an eighth of an inch in there an eighth of an inch in there Then I like to use this indexing ring that the one-way lathe comes on and you can see I've set it on 48 there and we'll mark out grids of probably two. So at 48 I'll make a line on here. I'll skip this one and I'll make a line on the second one. Then I'll rotate the indexing ring two and I'll make a line just on the second one here. Then I'll go to four and I'll make a line on the top one and the bottom one. Okay, so you're just staggering them so the jewelry doesn't... I'm just staggering them so that the, the earrings don't collide with each other. Right. And what my customers have told me is the more holes I can make, the better, right? Mm -hmm. Because they collect a lot of earrings. Mm -hmm. So the more holes I can make, they say the better. So then it's just a case of moving down in increments of two and making lines. One there, one there, and then the next two is just the middle one. Okay. okay. And so on and so forth. And so on and so forth. Then I like to get a, a little drill in my uh, Dremel tool and I take it up as fast as possible. I think this is about a 1 16th inch drill. Take it up as fast as possible. I point the jewelry tree between my legs so that it's nice and stable and then I draw two holes around each of those little lines so I draw one there and one here and then you draw every hole all the way down two little holes for each little line so that the two earrings, the pair of earrings, can hang together. Mm -hmm. So you can see on this tree there are plenty of holes for my customer to hang her earrings or his, his earrings. Okay. So now before you take this little nib off, it's important to return the piece to the lathe, turn your lathe speed down, and just sand off these pencil marks that you've made. If you try to do it later, it's quite a hard job by hand. So you just want to sit there. I'm going to move to a 600 grip. Move to a 600 grip sandpaper. Take my lathe speed up a little bit more. And just take off all those pencil lines. And just make sure you've erased them all because they do look a little bit ugly if the person turns over the piece and sees pencil lines. So folks, here's an example of, of one that I've made before. And I use a branding iron just to brand my brand in the bottom, my name. Because my signature is rather ugly, so I brand in this beautiful name, Dennis Fuge, with the Wolf's Four paw print. Because my, um, my name, my marketing name is Fuge's Wildwoods. And the paw print, the Wolf's Paw print is the wildest thing I could think of in the forest. So I'd brand it in with my branding iron and these, I, these you can buy from uh, Woodcraft. The signature obviously costs quite a lot more, but Woodcraft makes these um, branding irons. And folks, what I like to use is this Watco Danish oil, the natural one that you can get from the Home Depot. 
You can see I put rubber gloves on so that the hardness don't affect my, uh, my skin. And then you'll want to smother it with oil all over. Get that beautiful ambrosia or whatever design. This one is a one that was partially finished already. But you can see the beautiful coloration that you get in the wood. So that one already had at least one coat on. Is, yes. this, is this the second or third coat? This is the second coat. Second coat, okay. And what I like to do is I like to leave two days between coats. So it's the rule of twos. I put on a coat. Two hours later, I wipe the excess oil off. Then two days later, I put another coat on. Two hours later, I wipe the excess off. And then two days later, I will buff it with the bio buffing system. And I'll show you a little bit about the bio buffing system right now. So folks, I use the bio buffing system to buff all of my pieces. It adds an fin amazing finish to it. You can see this one is made out of an old pair of jeans. This is the Tripoli wax wheel. There you can see another one that I've made. I go through them so rapidly. These were the original ones. I, this is the original one I bought and you can see it's down to a, a small little nib so far. This is the second one made out of jeans. So I go through these triply wax wheels very, very rapidly. So I just make them up from old jeans. I sit in front of the television watching a Yankee game or whatever, cut these little rings out, put the bolt in and I have myself a triply wax wheel. The white diamond and the uh, Carnuba wax wheels, I do buy the originals from Bio Buffing System because their cutting properties are ever so slightly different. And you can see these are two of my original wheels and I haven't really gone through them that fast. So that's one little tip if you want to make your own buffing wheels, just use a pair of old jeans. So we'll just buff this one little piece of this uh, one item. Now obviously you need to be careful when you're buffing one of these jewelry trees it's going to tend to grab you and pull it away from you if you hit a little edge like that the wheel's going to pull it away from you so you need to be fairly slow and cautious and you need to buff it with your triply wax first see if you catch an edge like that it's going to throw it throw you throw it down you need to just be careful And once you've finished with the triple E wax, what I do is I turn my lathe into reverse. I buff my fingers up while I'm doing it. <laughs> and my fingernails are probably the shiniest in the house. I spin that wheel off. I put it into fast forward and I spin the white diamond wax on. Once it's going, you add the white diamond wax. Once more, buff your item. Just be careful it doesn't pull it out of your hand. And once you're done with a white diamond, once more it's the same. Switch off the lathe, turn it into reverse. Buff your fingernails. You get the shiniest fingernails in the, in the neighborhood. And then you turn on your wax wheel. Now carnauba wax is the hardest wax in the world, it comes from a palm tree and people can handle your items all day long and their, their fingerprints will not show up on your work. Now the carnauba wax tends to be a little bit more grabby so you have to be careful as you buff your item, it will tend to want to spin it out of your hands. Turn the lathe speed up a little bit more so that it really buffs it nicely. And you can see the absolutely beautiful shine that you get on your, your piece of work. There's the ambrosia beetle hole again. You get an absolutely beautiful finish on your jewelry tree. Now folks, I find these to be very, very popular with people with pierced ears because you can hang your earrings on and you can really make a, a, a lot of earrings, hang a lot of earrings on a piece like this. So I find them to be very special. And you can also make wooden rings. I made a couple here out of uh, African blackwood. There's one that fits on the top. I think that's um, redwood burl. And that's just a piece of maple. 
So you can make your darling or your partner rings, earrings, and then obviously chains can fit in the, in the bottom here. So I find these to be very, very special gifts for ladies, or you can sell them. I sell them at about $30 a tier because it takes me about that time to make a piece. So this piece would sell for about $60, all signed up with my name. And this one would sell probably for about $120 or $100. So a very special gift if you want to make them for Christmas or for any, any gift for your loved one. Do think about making a jewelry tree. Okay, Dennis, thanks a lot. That was a terrific lesson and always fun to visit with you. See you on the next video. Well, that certainly was a terrific visit over to Dennis's shop. We spent several hours together. This was the first video of the jewelry tree the next video will be on making mice so thank you dennis very much here's his contact information and you can contact him either on his email or his website and hey you guys know to drill if you like my content and dennis is also thank you for watching and please like comment and subscribe until next time i'll see you on another episode of bob's woodshop